Hi, I am Naz Nazawa. I'm an interior designer and I'm here with Design Milk for DMTV Milkshake. I'm super excited. I'm here in San Francisco. This is my home. This is my vessel. We're gonna shake up the milk. We're gonna answer some questions. Um, I'm excited. Okay, first question. What do clients most often need to be convinced of? Something they can't totally grasp until they see it completed. I love this question. Um, honestly, a lot of how the room is gonna feel is something that I think you really need to wait until the project is done and walk into your new home or your new space in order to really feel the way that we as interior designers really like envision things coming to life. Um, I think you can kind of get a sense of how the colors are gonna come together. You can you know, get a sense of what the patterns are gonna be like or what the overall vibe or how the flow is gonna go. But to know how you're really going to feel and why investing in interior design was totally worth it, that takes really seeing it come to life. Um, that's what I think. Okay, next one. By the way, this is, a, this is a really great vase. It is from Angus and Celeste. It's a ceramic studio out of Australia. Okay, next question. What's one piece of advice you return to over and over? This one is super easy. Uh, I always say, uh, if you love it, that's the end of the road for me. It means if you super love something, whether it's sentimental, whether it's something that you just already knew that wasn't gonna work, but you just can't stop thinking about it, I believe that your home should be filled with things that you love, even if they don't make sense to somebody else, even if they are things that you probably know don't go with the rest of the things that you're putting together, if you love it, that's really important. And it's something that I always continue to exercise for myself. If I am not sure, I need to go back to my instincts. And if I go back to my instincts and I'm super sure, I can't stop thinking about it, even though it's like, oh, this is a little impractical or it's not exactly the thing that I had in mind, but I just love it so much, you will find a way for it to work in your home. My silly art right behind me, this uh, colored cats, this is colored pencil, cats drawing. The paper has yellowed, it's like 15 years old. My best friend and I colored it during a snowstorm when I was in college and she sent it to me years later when she was moving out of the dorms. I had it framed, it's so silly. It literally doesn't make any sense. I could totally put something else in these two spots on the wall instead, but I love them so much and they make me laugh. And I think if you have a home that is filled with and surrounds you with things that remind you of love, good memories and laughter, that you can't go wrong. So if you love it, that's it. Okay, next question. Uh, clearly I can talk, huh? All right. What is your favorite color combination? Okay, this is impossible, but also I'm gonna do my best. Uh, the reason it's impossible is because I pretty much love all color combinations. I think weird things go well together. I love that, but there is always a little bit of a system, a little bit of a a little bit of a science to what I consider sort of like weirdo magic beauty. Um, and that is combining warm tones with cool tones and then making sure that you have a black point in your design. In photography, basically what black point means is what is the darkest thing in your picture or in your room in the context of interiors? I really think that it's really important for any room to be grounded with something in the space that is quite dark. That allows your eye to relax and understand, well, if this is dark, then everything else color-wise in the space relates to some form of darkness elsewhere in the room. Uh, but yeah, I mean, personally, currently, I'm loving like peaches and oranges mixed with turquoise blues and cobalts. I love the orange and blue combination. A couple of folks on my Instagram have kind of noticed that that's, a, that's various shades of blue, various shades of like warm orange to rusty yellow uh, appear in my work pretty often. So uh, I'm gonna leave it at that because I really don't think that there should be rules uh, beyond, again, do you love it? Is there a black point? And make sure that you have warm tones and cool tones in the same space. That's how I love to combine color. But if you also love a monochrome moment, I'm here for that, I'm here for you. I just love all color. Okay. Let's see what's next. This one's real folded up. Okay, of the many ways the pandemic has changed how we live in our spaces, what do you think we will retain? Uh, well, I can tell you what I hope that we will retain, which is that design is really about personal choices that are for you. I think so frequently when it was pre-pandemic, I was having conversations with clients, potential clients, 
friends of mine who were homeowners. And a lot of times the questions would come back to, is this going to affect my resale value? Is this going to be popular amongst future homeowners in five years, 10 years or whatever? And there was always this like energy around are we going to leave this home and upsize or change our whole environment or move on in some capacity that is keeping us from being able to visualize making design choices that are just for us and that always really broke my heart and at least in a little way because i feel very strongly that if you are taking the time to do design then you should be making choices for you. I really, really do. It comes back to the thing about you loving your home, loving the things that are in it. Um, I really feel like one of the things that has changed in the conversations I've been having about home with homeowners and with clients about the, the way that the pandemic has changed their mindset is people are making decisions to invest in their homes for themselves. I think being home as much as we've had to be during the pandemic has really awakened or reawakened our love of and appreciation for the surroundings that we have, our shelters that keep us safe. And so that means that if you have like $50 to spend, it might be silly, but you're going to pick that mug that you super love or you're going to buy a plant that's just for you and you're going to be home often enough to take care of it or on a larger scale if you're choosing to do a renovation so that your home is more functionally fitted to the way that you use your space the choices that you make on tile or countertops or otherwise are going to be things that are made to bring you joy or made to make you happy and it's a lot less about making choices that restrict your joy and your full happiness in your home just in order to think about resale. So that's what I really hope is going to stick around. I don't know that it will. I don't think home offices are gonna stick around forever. Um, but I really hope that you designing for you is, is something that will stick around. Okay, I think I've got time for like one more. So let's do this. Can you discuss your background, how your background in art history shapes your work today? A hundred percent. So for those of you who don't know, I had a super nerdy uh, business degree. I went to my undergrad college for business and I focused in marketing. I liked marketing, but I was actually honestly like not super into my business degree. So I ended up minoring in art history with a focus in modern architecture and design. And I loved it so much. And the things that it did for me and how it influences my design right now is having an appreciation for the rigor and study of things that came before us. Uh, a thing that actually is really important too in how art history shapes the way that I think about design. And you can see an example actually right behind me in this Yaya situation vase that I'm obsessed with. Um, I really, really, really was frustrated by how much focus my art history minor and my art history education formally focused on Western European, honestly, usually white male artists, architects, designers, and otherwise. Um, there's such a vast world out there. And yet we had like a single course that was for like all Asian art. And yet there were courses that were like modern architecture from 1900 to 1945, modern and postmodern architecture, 1946 to present. So you could get that specific and that dialed in, in the scholarliness around Western male driven art and architecture, but all of Asian art all of African art, one course for one semester. I'm not here for that. So that has actually really influenced a lot because now that I know and how I know how to appreciate the history and the, the amazingness of going deep and really understanding the why, who created and developed these things, what were the materials that they had available to them and who were they designing or creating for, knowing all of that really enriches my appreciation for antiquities, my appreciation for old stuff, my appreciation for how old things are present and showing up and continuing to inspire us to this day. Um, but it also means that I love African art, West African art, Asian, East Asian, South Asian. Like I have such an appreciation for wanting to learn from everywhere that is available to us uh, that we can be inspired by and learn from one another, from one another's cultures and consider them all on the same level. So that, you know, whereas people will describe African art as primitive, which I find, you know, offensive, um, we can actually put that on the same pedestal as we put, you know, the, the Sistine Chapel, for example. Okay, that's it. I'm out of time. Clearly I can talk forever. Thank you so much, Design Milk. Thank you, DMTV. This has been such a blast. I hope you learned something a little bit about me uh, and I'm signing off. Take care.